This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. That really wonderful TV year, 1985. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So I've collected TV Guide fall preview issues over the years and thought it would be fun to talk about which shows made it, which shows didn't, and which ones we actually watched. I have to give credit to Ken Reed's TV Guidance Counselor podcast for this idea. We have some early starters that premiered before the fall of 1985. Crazy Like a Fox on CBS. Senior private eye con artist Jack Warden isn't ready for the home yet. His attorney son, John Rubenstein, keeps getting pulled into his dad's cases. Penny Pazer plays the attorney's wife and Robbie Kiger, his son. Lydia Lay, then Patricia I.M. Thompson, played his secretary. The show ran for two seasons and was a top ten hit before CBS bounced it around their schedule. A TV movie, Still Crazy Like a Fox, appeared a year later. Hometown, also on CBS, not to be confused with Home Space Town, an HDTV series, Essentially a big chill ripoff, the show was about college friends dealing with their now adult lives. Jane Kaczmarek, Andrew Rubin, and Daniel Stern starred. The audience didn't get or give much of a chance to learn about the characters. It was premiered in August and was gone by October. Moonlighting on ABC, the series that shot Bruce Willis into su- super stardom and resurrected Sybil Shepard's career. It also established the dramedy as a TV genre. Meet Maddie Hayes, a former model whose accountant embezzled all her money. She's left with a detective agency designed to lose money as a tax write-off, run by David Addison. He sees his cushy job disappearing and convinces her to run the place herself with himself as the lead investigator, using her fame to get clients. Alice Beasley plays Agnes, the office secretary, and Curtis Armstrong plays a junior detective and Agnes's love interest. That last point becomes very important, as the show over time began to concentrate on their relationship because Shepard and Willis's off-screen acrimony made it necessary to do so. In fact, the show became known for long delays between episodes due to the, that acrimony and the length of the scripts. Dialogue was over, uh, often overlapping and very fast. Moonlighting often broke the fourth wall, actors directly addressing the audience, a prop master ending a scene by literally walking into it and taking the gun from the bad guy. I remember one line of dialogue from David telling Maddie to come in, find your key light. A key light is designed to illuminate a particular performer and they find where to stand in order to be lit best. The creator of the series, Glenn Gordon Caron, was forced out in the last season by the two leads. He had written much of the series, including a fantasy-heavy episode about a 1940s murder with a long black-and-white dream sequence, which, by the way, cost a fortune because he insisted that they use black-and-white film for Uh it instead of just decolorizing color (laughs) film. And a remake of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, which was, of course, the basic theme of the series. Moonlighting would run for five seasons, three of them in the top ten. Top 30. Mr. Belvedere on ABC, a stalwart of TGIF and another example of the Butler Nanny Resolves Family Issues genre. Christopher Hewitt is the eponymous butler. Bob Euchre plays the dad, who up to this point was a sports announcer beer ad guy. The whole thing is based on a 1947 novel which was turned into the film Sitting Pretty, as well as three failed pilots going back to 1956. This Mr. Belvedere ran for six seasons, despite never getting into the top 30. So now let's move into the actual series of the fall, starting on Saturday with Hollywood Beat, ABC. Undercover cops Jack Scalia and Jay Avacone tackle the mean streets of L.A. Speaking of tackles, John Matuzak plays one of their informants, a former NFL defensive end who decided to become an actor. His character was gay, a bold choice in 1985, but nobody gave him any hassles due to his size. An obvious Miami Vice clone, the show was gone by November. Lime Street on ABC. Robert Wagner returns to TV after his long run on Heart to Heart. He plays a widower raising two daughters, living with his father, Lou Ayers, 
and running an insurance investigation business. One of the daughters was played by Samantha Smith, who wrote a letter to the Soviet premier telling him of her concerns about possible nuclear war. She became a media celebrity visiting the USSR and then parlayed her notoriety into a showbiz career, which was then tragically cut short. She died in a plane crash after shooting a few episodes of the TV series. Despite low ratings, ABC chose to continue the series despite one of the main characters disappearing, she wasn't recast, and then later throwing in the towel at the producer's request. That producer was Linda Bloodworth Thomason, who would go on into more successful series a year later, Designing Women. And speaking of successful series... The Golden Girls, NBC. Creator Susan Harris, up to this point, was best known for Soap and Benson, but this series changed that. For experienced gals, share a house in Miami. Dorothy, B. Arthur, Rose, Betty White, Blanche, Rue McClanahan, and Sophia Estelle Getty, playing Dorothy's mother. The show came out of a skit performed on an NBC fall preview special the previous year, <laughs> where Selma Diamond and Doris Roberts of Night Court and Remington Steel, respectively at that point, did a takeoff on Miami Vice called Miami Nice. <laughs> NBC senior VP Warren Littlefield was inspired by the sketch to make a show about seniors. A simple concept, but a huge hit for NBC, staying in the top 30 for all of its seven seasons, five of those in the top 10. The show got 68 Emmy nominations over its run, winning 11, with all of the leads getting an Emmy. Only All in the Family and Will and Grace can match that. The show also spawned three spin-offs, The Golden Palace, a single sequel, season sequel after B. Arthur left the show, Empty Nest, the Richard Mulligan sitcom, which would also run seven seasons, and Nurses, a three-season spin-off of Empty Nest. The Golden Girls does very well in syndication to this day. 227 on NBC. Marla Gibbs returns to TV after a long run as the Jeffersons made Florence. In fact, 227 began a year earlier than planned when the Jeffersons was canceled abruptly. Mm. They thought they were going to get another season. It didn't happen. The show was based on a play about women living in a predominantly black apartment building with the address 227. Marla plays Mary, a very similar character to Florence. She's got a husband and a teenage daughter, played by a young Regina King. She also has neighbors, including Sandra, a sex pot, played by Jack A. Harry, Gibbs' character has a sharp tongue and uses it liberally on the show. That show was a major hit in the top 30 for three of its five seasons. Now let's take a look at Sunday. MacGyver on ABC. If you need someone to make a bomb out of a paperclip and chewing gum, call for this former Special Forces agent and troubleshooter played by Richard Dean Anderson. His boss at the Phoenix Foundation, a shadowy do-gooder private company was a TV trope at the time, was played by Dana Elkar. MacGyver would save the day, the girl, the world, every week. It was a hit, running for seven seasons. It also generated two TV movies, a proposed Young MacGyver series, and a reboot starting in 2016, and a knockoff SNL sketch stretched into a movie called MacGruber. Patty and Selma Bouvier on The Simpsons adore Anderson, and he even appeared on that series. Amazing Stories on NBC. Steven Spielberg comes to television, writing and producing an anthology series which will end up as the trope of 1985. In order to get Spielberg, the network had to agree to a two-year contract. The show was not a big hit, but it did become a cult favorite. It was rather Twilight Zone-y, with people put into incredible situations, sometimes humorous, sometimes tragic. Two episodes I remember, an alien signal is picked up. They are doing knockoffs of the 1950s TV series they picked up from us. <laughs> Then they come to Earth and are greeted by Milton Berle. <laughs> a teenager discovers a chemical which will turn a picture into 3D life, so he uses it to get a supermodel. He keeps using the wrong amount of the chemical, though. At one point, he creates a giant model, and another one where only half a model is stuck to the magazine. <laughs> Spielberg's clout brought in actors and directors who normally wouldn't touch TV with a 10-foot pole. Then Alfred Hitchcock Presents on NBC. Yep, this was the year of the anthology. The series began with colorized introduction from Hitchcock's original 55 to 65 series, the first person in history to come back from the dead to host a show. Then newer updated versions of his creepy tales were shown. The series ran for a year on NBC, then a second year on USA. But Mark, there are too many shows, so we're going to have to go to a second episode. Okie doke. 
In the meantime, while you're waiting for us, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife Treat Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. Thank you for being afraid.